acknowledgement on behalf of the Lishan Ohlone people on whose land we stand. Vallejo is unsettled land and Lishan, the Lishan Ohlone people whose ancestors had a relationship with this land for thousands of years prior to colonization of the Catholic Church, the Mexican land grants, and what is now called the United States. The Lishan Ohlone still survive after 200 years of occupation on their land and invite you to be good guests as you live, work, and play in their territory. They send greetings to all the participants in rooted black and brown bodies with plants um, and thank Edgar and Avera del Comalito Collective Cultural Arts Center for organizing such a beautiful event. Great. And now a little bit about what we're thinking about in terms of, of, of the creation of this show. Um, so this show came about uh, from the success of the first show that we did, where we wanted to reclaim our existence by sharing our stories about um, about the sacred bodies of color and their connection to the land. Um, our relationship to that connection can be a conflicting one, especially for black and brown bodies as they relate to the history of this country via slavery and genocide. Uh, furthermore, the conversation about what a black and brown body looks like uh, when colorism and racism is a strong, has a stronghold in our communities is a, is a necessary and complicated one. Uh, the themes that are being addressed in this show range and vary uh, from labor to plants as memory, uh, symbolism of change and growth, ancestral knowledge, plants as reflection of our own lives, plants and connections, um, plants as metaphor, uh, and many more. We hope you enjoy the curation and admire the amazing works by these amazing artists we have. Definitely. And to kind of expand on what, what Abel said, you know, with Black and Brown Bodies with Plants Part One, um, we, uh, that was a, a by invitation um, uh, exhibition. So Abel and I invited uh, artists and specific works to be part of the show. And with that, we were able to tackle some of the themes um, from the same statement that we put out for this open call, which were like how settler colonialism and colonialism have, um, uh, attempted to sever the connection that people of color, Black, Indigenous, and folks of color have with the land, with the environment, both spiritually um, and physically, um, and to, to kind of explore what some of those relationships are like. So with the first show, we actually got to, to help navigate that conversation and talk about you know, some of the literal things, right? But that, and we talked about like melanin and colorism, and we made it very intentional that um, the experience uh, when we talked about black and brown bodies, that it was very literal black and brown bodies. Um, and with this experience, um, you know, we, we didn't know what we were going to get because it was an open call. And we really talked about, we don't want to be gatekeepers of these conversations. We don't want to um, identity uh, police. We don't want to um, um, engage in kind of those identity politics or policing because we don't believe in policing. Um, but we wanted the, the, the conversation to be guided by the artists. So with this one, you know, the, the experience is not necessarily, uh, or the experience kind of varies, right? We have black and brown artists, we have white Latinx artists, we have um, a wide range of folks because we wanted that conversation to be guided by the artists and the work. We have trans bodies. So now we're talking about the relationship that plants have to the body and how that body is different. We have non-binary bodies. So um, um, really we're excited that this um, show is going to open up hopefully conversations either in today's discussion or individually as folks navigate the gallery on their own to talk about some of these themes. And I think one of the important things to also mention about uh, why we opened up the space that we do and why we continue to do the work that we do is because I feel that it is important as, as people of color to have events like this where we can all see each other uh, and engage in conversations, even though we're not present with each other, uh, that the work that we have created uh, uh, has a conversation with each other, right? And that that work that is being produced is, a very important, is very important work and that it's work that is being done now. Yes. So with that said, um, we would like to go ahead and um, just kind of set the intention um, for the, the tone, know that this is a a loving, healing, growing space um, where, um, yeah, let's let's um, let's engage in just a really beautiful, loving conversation with everyone. Um, especially, we always talk about, uh, you know, in, in our classes and in our times that in times of chaos, like a time of pandemic, right? 
that um, artists are really magical in the sense that we are oftentimes taught to break stuff down both in academia and outside of academia and that artists have this really magical ability to create something especially in times of destruction and that's powerful so with that said you know most of um or or we know that performing arts live on the margins of the fine art world so we always try and be intentional about um, making sure that we invite a performing artist um, and paying this, the performing artist um, because um, we need more performing arts within the fine arts world. And today we have the pleasure of inviting Pepe to perform. And I will have Abel introduce Pepe. Mm -hmm. Pepe is a gender fluid queer poet activist from Santa Ana, California. Their art touches on lived experience such as being Chicanex, queer love and freedom, gentrification, and resisting the uh, foster care carceral system. Pepe's poetry emphasizes the strength of love and perseverance of freedom and dignity. And currently they're performing poetry, creating writing workshops for the LGBTQ plus community and facilitating dream mapping workshops for system impacted youth. So we are excited um, if Pepe is on um, to uh, invite Pepe uh, to perform. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here. I am really excited to be able to share these pieces for you. I wanna quickly let everyone know that um, this exhibition is very beautiful. I've been looking at it over and over again this whole week. I've been sitting with your description. So everything that the artist wrote from the bio to the caption to the title, I read it all. Um, many of them I revisited and so keep an eye out, keep an ear out, you know, if you've been looking at the exhibition and you know some of these titles, you might hear something from the caption or you might hear something from the story behind it in some of these poems. Um, and just know that the whole exhibition, the experience, the virtual innovative experience in and of itself has really informed um, these poems. So I'm, I'm grateful to share these with you all today. The first one is called Corazón Verde, or Green Heart. Tengo el corazón verde. I have a green heart. Vibrant as the leaves in my throne of trees, me siento. And the branches hold me. Me siento sostenida. Connecting my corazón to the trees, mis árbol primis me hablan. They tell me, it's time to shift our contemplation, so focused on the buds, the fruits, the flowers. We overlooked our cousin's corazones, heart spaces rooted in darkness underneath the surface. I asked, trees, what is it like to reach the skies and live underground, to see me 50 feet above and feel my footsteps from below? Me responden, is that why you measure the width of my trunk, the breadth of my branches, but never quite calculate the connections I created underground? Mother put traces of my life into tree rings, and I need you to decipher these cycles. I look, the spaces of brown, dark, brown, dark a code like our black and brown cultures, genealogies running deep as the roots of burdock, medicine driving us closer to the heart of earth, madre, janan, mami, sacred healer, crowning us in thick leaves, petals, salvia, calendula, the smells anointing our skin, obsidian shining, dark streak of the tiger's eye beaming. This is a healing, a blessing, a baptism to remind you your divine nature. We are all Juangas, living the rich colors of life in the deep darkness of truth. No good, no bad, just vida. We are all touched by the light. And there are also parts of us waiting to be heard underground. Thank you. 
So that was <laughs> the first one. I'm loving everyone's facial responses. It's, it's very interesting reading on Zoom because you have to really pay attention to, yeah, the heart reactions, the chats. Thank you. And if there's ever any lines that stand out to you, I'd love to hear it in the chats. I always go back afterwards and reread them. Let me take some of this. So this next one is called Otoño, which means fall. The season where some of us are really excited <laughs> to embrace. Um, and it's called, so it starts Otoño. I'm sorry, do you hear that in the back? The car? <laughs> okay. Yeah, but it's okay. When, when you live with people, right? When you live with other people nearby, you know, once I have my mansion, you know, and I, and I have my Oprah yard, we won't have this problem. But until then, you know, Otoño, Otoño. I wonder why we poets sing for spring and lament the fall, the winter forcing us to rest, recover, admit to seeking shelter and warmth. There are seasons we've forgotten to honor, cycles we crowded out with all of our clinging to the spring. La primavera no es eterna, para nada ni nadie. So I want to praise the fall, the dying away of all we thought necessary, down to the roots again. Like the agave, my process of fruition is a simultaneous death. Only my roots will remain ready to begin again. A new plant, a new life, a new fruit, a new death. <clears throat> I want to praise, yes, death and decay, the smell of dried leaves rotting, rotting under watchful trunks, stems, skies. This is where the rose hip medicine is born. This is not just the stink of death. This is the reek of resurrection too. I know because I've seen this transformation turning all colors back to earth and back to life. The stench becomes its own marker of progress from fungal growths to new soil, ready to carry the cycles again. So when I say you can't kill us, I am literal. Y cuando grito, Berta Cáceres, vive! Berta Cáceres, presente, te lo explico. Su lucha viene bien arraigada. You cut one dandelion's head and her seeds split across the fruitful soil. We grow back 10, 20, thousands. Thank you. Yes, Pepe, that was magic. You are magic. Thank you so much for being here and for, for blessing us all with your beautiful palabras and your beautiful work. Um, um, if you would please, Pepe, um, share um, in the message or in the chat um, your um, handle in case folks would like to follow your work. Um, and also, again, everything that we do is, um, is volunteer-based and free. Um, if you feel inclined, Pepe, to share your Venmo or your Cash App and folks would like to donate, um, know that y'all are welcome to do that as well. And um, Pepe, would you like to share where folks can find your work? Yes. So I just put in my Instagram handle in the chat. It's at underscore Flor de Nopal. Um, cactus are crazy. So I just had to, you know, and um, I'll put my Venmo in there in a bit, but you can also find my Patreon you know, flordenopal, patreon.com forward slash flordenopal. So you can go find out more of the works there. And there is free content on my Patreon. So it's not only for paying customers. So thank you so much for having me here. I feel really blessed and honored to share this space with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pepe. Thank you. All right. So that was a beautiful way to set the intention. Thank you, Pepe. And so um, let's go ahead and navigate over to the virtual gallery. I'm going to share my screen with y'all. And um, so it's this one here. 
And so the way that you get to the virtual gallery is by going to our website, elcomalitocollective.com, and then it's under the current exhibition. And then um, you navigate, um, oops. you navigate um, down to the enter exhibition. I do wanna point out here um, that we have the Segorte Land Trust. All of our events are free, but if anyone feels inclined um, or um, to, to donate to the Segorte Land Trust, that goes back to the Ohlone people whose land um, we are occupying in Vallejo, California, or we also encourage you to um, donate to the indigenous communities um, where you all occupy. So um, to navigate, it's pretty user-friendly, I like to think, um, but that's because I built it. Um, <laughs> so if uh, anyone has any questions as to how to navigate, let us know. But the way that you navigate a piece or you navigate is by using the arrows on the bottom right, or you can also use your cursor or your finger or your stylus. Um, if you select a piece of art, um, it'll bring you to the art, the title, and the name of the artist. And if you click on the info, then you'll get to, to see all of the information that the artist submitted for the piece and whether or not it's for sale. There are two rooms in the, in the gallery, um, and not all of the artists were shared uh, or were, were um, not all of the art pieces were uh, hung based on the artist, but more about conversations that the pieces could have. So feel free to navigate this on your own. Um, we will be navigating it and um, staying on the art piece for the artist that's currently speaking. Um, and we would like to invite Jose, if you'd like to start Jose, we know that you're on the East Coast. So we wanted to be considerate of time in case you needed to, and you also have a familia in case you needed to, um, to um, step away. Uh, so thank you. Uh, my name is Jose Flores Chamale. Um, I, um, I'm from New York, but I was born in Guatemala. Um, the, 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 the focus of my overall work is reconnecting with my indigenous roots. Um, for me, uh, being a person of, of Central American heritage, um, you know, for me, it's always been a struggle with identity um, and growing up in a diaspora of here in the United States, I always felt um, not as connected as I, I would have if, if I had my grandparents with me and my family with me. So I, I, I for a long time, I struggled with my racial identity. Um, you know, and I think that overall, um, it's actually a good conversation to have now as we're in the beginning stages of uh, Latinx Heritage Month. Um, but for a long time, I never felt included and I never understood why. Um, and what I've come to realize now as, as an adult is that um, there is a very whitewashed view of what Latinidad so-called is. Um, as, I, as, I, as I moved and I processed my artwork, I realized that I had a whole um, a heritage that was waiting for me to, to not only to uh, be rediscovered, but also to be expressed. Um, so uh, for me, this is something that um, is, is something, a topic that I'm constantly touching on as, as I, as I um, create new pieces. Um, this one in particular is called Berta Vive. Um, it was actually in coordination with um, with a relative from, from uh, California, from Honduras. And we raised funds for um, the prisoners, uh, pol political prisoners in Honduras that were uh, in prison for fighting to protect their land. Um, and we created this piece uh, alongside a couple of different um, uh, link uh, elders who kind of guided us and gave us a, a, a certain guidance on what to paint. Um, but we also created a uh, limited print run of this. Um, we were able to raise $1,000 to go to these political prisoners and their families back in Honduras. Uh, if if, if y'all don't know who Berta is, Berta Cortez is, a, is, she is um, a uh, elder from Honduras who uh, was assassinated uh, protecting her land against um, multinational um, companies that were trying to create a dam and putting the sacred water in uh, danger. Um, and that's who she, that's who it is right now. And, and when, when we talk about, uh, and so how eloquently Pepe put it at the end is that Berta may be not here with physically, but she lives with all of us as we continue this fight against 
um, you know, capitalistic, nationalistic forces, um, but I, that have continually to try to separate us from our indigenous heritage for a reason. Um, so this was an homage to her. Um, and that's what Berta Vive is. I would love for you if you all have uh, more questions about that or if you have any more um, uh, you know, questions about that, uh, my handle on Instagram is sangre underscore indigena underscore art. Um, and that, that's my Instagram. You all can definitely uh, check out my work there as well. Perfect, thank you so much, um, Jose. Um, and Jose actually has three pieces in the show. So feel free to, to take a look at um, some of um, Jose's other work. And I know that one is here. So I'll just quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I'm in the process of creating uh, a actual solo exhibit um, here in Long Island in New York, uh, based on our creation story of the Popo Vu or Pupu, which is the original name given to uh, the sacred text of the Maya people. Um, and it's a creation story. Um, what I love looking at this is that we've been taught one view of what creation is, and it has been through a foreign view, um, which is called the Bible. Um, but that's not what our ancestors uh, were, what what they viewed as their cosmovision. Um, so for me, doing a lot of part of uh, a lot of work of this uh, reconnecting with my indigenous heritage is really getting to know our creation story. Uh, and this piece is called Blood Woman, uh, where it's the part where. Um, you know, it, it's based on the hero twins that uh, of creation, which um, I know that it sounds like mythological, but it, it's actually quite scientific. Um, it's quite mathematical. It's quite astronomical when you when you learn it from uh, elders from from uh, the from the Maya. Uh, so for me, I, I've been doing a lot of um, a, a lot of studying with a Quiche elder from Guatemala, uh, more specific Shela. And uh, we're, we're really breaking down the Popovu and what it really means. What does it mean? And I know that for a lot of, uh, for, I know it's viewed as folklore and mythological, but it's way beyond that. Um, if we understand it from a lens, from a Western point of view, we'll definitely view it that way. But when the elder breaks it down and what the symbolism is, um, it's actually more of a, of a almanac. It's more of a way to understand our, our, our plant relatives and how are we in balance with, with that and then the, and the astro. So uh, for me, that, that's been an incredible journey. journey. So if you, again, if you all wanna see the rest of the exhibit, um, I've been putting up on my Instagram and I will have a virtual event October 26th. You're all welcome. It's a free event. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go into depth a little bit about what the meanings of some of these stories are. Thank you so much, Jose. And if you um, could, Jose, drop your handle in the chat and then folks can follow you. Great. And uh, again, Jose has one more piece in the show. So feel free to take a look at that piece um, on your own. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Jose. Since we're here and Jocelyn, and I see Jocelyn is on the call. Jocelyn, we would love to um, invite you to share a little bit about your work. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> what an honor to be part of this beautiful exhibit and Pepe, thank you so much for sharing those poems. Um, I don't know, I feel like the, a rush of emotions. I don't know if anyone else felt that, you know, it's like the, the mention of these plants and these healing uh, teachers and all this, uh, it brings up this, you know, this uh, deep connection that we have and that I feel that we've lost. And so that resonated with me and uh, my current work as a, like this piece that you see um, before you, it deals with that. Um, for me, I'm drawing the connection between motherhood and mother nature. I'm so sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm like super nervous. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, yeah, my son is here, so you might hear him. <laughs> so, um, for me, it's drawing that connection between uh, motherhood and mother nature. And uh, here I've depicted myself in, in the fullness of my pregnancy. Mommy, and I'm laying in front of this, uh, this natural landscape. I'm, I'm originally from Brownsville, Texas. I currently reside here. And that's in the El Valle del Rio Grande in, in uh, deep South Texas, like right at the very tip, 
we're a border town. We're um, on the border with Matamoros, Tamaulipas. And so this, uh, this landscape, you see mesquites and you see other hardy plants that you would find here. And um, for me, the, becoming a mother and uh, reconnecting with myself, it's, it's been quite a journey of, of just that, you know, of discovering who I am, remembering my, my roots, my honoring my ancestors and just wanting to know more and diving deeper into that, that history, just, uh, you know, just remembering how deeply connected we were to, you know, La Madre Naturaleza, the Great Mother, and how over the years colonization and, and everything, like the consequence of that, how that's actually disrupted our connection with that. And so for me, it, to one, bring out an awareness, like these are the things around us, you know, and maybe you might not notice them, but they're there, but they're just tied to an urban landscape. And um, so it's that, and then just uh, just honoring my ancestors and and just trying to remember who who I am, you know. And I, I know it's it's just part of this uh, ongoing journey of of uh, rediscovery. So that's that's basically what this painting is about. Beautiful. Thank you so much for for sharing, Jocelyn. And it's yeah, an honor yes, <laughs> No, and it's um, to have your work. And if you wouldn't mind, Jocelyn, um, also typing into the chat any website or social media handles that you'd like folks to to be able to connect it to, feel free to add those to the chat again. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I did want to add really quick. Um, hold on. Um, I'm also I'm working as a, the art director of a nonprofit organization. We're called Craft. I'll go ahead and leave the the handle for our Instagram. We're called Creative Assistance for Texas. And what we do is we're trying to provide um, wellness through the arts. And so anything from the visual arts to music, to writing, and we, we eventually want to incorporate dance and uh, even theater. So all these outlets of expression because we feel that it's so, so important to be connected to that and, and be able to express oneself. And a lot of times people are so shut down and so disconnected from their, themselves that it's hard to be open and it's hard to be vulnerable. And so we're really trying to give access to the community, to artists, to provide platforms so that they can share themselves, they, they can open themselves up to their community and be embraced by you know, their, their community and the people around them. And you know, just kind of remembering like, hey, like whatever struggles that you're going through, you're not alone. Like you're, you're not alone in your struggle, whatever that is, like someone else has, has been through something similar or, you know, know someone that is also struggling. So we really truly believe that the arts can help, uh, you know, manifest this well-being and, and truly heal your, your soul, like from, from within. So that's uh, our nonprofit, Creative Assistance for Texas. We're still a fledgling organization, but we're trying to partner up with other nonprofits here in Texas and, and beyond and hopefully, you know, become a well-established uh, nonprofit. And I really love what you all are doing at El Comalito. It's, it's truly amazing to be able to provide this platform also for BIPOC artists. It's, it's so amazing what you guys are doing. Thank you, Jocelyn, and thank you for the work that you do, Gambian. And let's connect um, offline, and maybe we can partner. Of course, I'll leave the info in the chat. Thank you all so much. Thank you so so much. Um, also, I saw that Alexis was on as well. Alexis uh, Rios created this beautiful piece um, titled um, uh, "Solo Quiero Sentirme Bien," and um, they also have another piece um, which I will share in a second. But uh, Alexis, if you'd like to share a little bit about your work, hi. Yes. Um, so this piece took me a long, 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 long time to uh, finish, just because it's just such a personal uh, piece, um, and it was it was tough. It was like there. Therapy, but um, it was definitely worth it. And um, a lot of folks have unfortunately related to it. Um, so, um, you know, if, if it's brought me comfort and it's brought others comfort, you know, then um, yeah, it was worth it for sure. Um, but um, I definitely, I basically just wanted to use plants as a way to, to symbolize growth, 
Um, some of these plants belong to my grandmother. Um, and um, you'll see behind me, both of the uh, nightgowns belong to my grandmother's. Um, so on my left side um, with the figure, uh, with the bun, we do have like my grandfather's cane on that side, as well as the candle that I had lit um, while we were praying for them um, since we weren't allowed to uh, visit them in the hospitals. So, um, you know, on the other side, same thing. Uh, it was the candle for that grandmother as well. Um, so this whole thing just basically um, captures the process of healing and having to rely on oneself during isolation for sure. Great, thank you so much for sharing. Would you like to share about your other piece, Alexis? Or um, would you uh, just Yes, out? yes, absolutely. My other piece is just an homage to my friend um, who is just the most magical person. <laughs> um, but it's also watercolor and it's also uh, chalk pastel. Um, and it's just, just me loving up on Rose and how wonderful they are, even though they've been through so much as, um, as a non-binary queer educator in the Valley. Um, they've gone through a lot, but even so, like they still remain tender. So I just thought it would be nice to uh, commemorate that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alexis, for, for again, trusting us with your work and for participating. And then also we just wanted to remind folks that, you know, when we talk about black and brown bodies in the United States, um, that oftentimes it becomes very Latinx centric, um, even though I personally identify as uh, indigenous to Canex, um, and Latinx also encompasses like a ton of communities that sometimes folks identify with, don't identify with, um, and that because it becomes Latinx centric, uh, depending on what coast you are, it also becomes very Mexican centric. And we want to acknowledge that being brown is not just Latinx. And we have the privilege of having Navjeet here um, to share a little bit about um, their work as well. Navjeet, I see that you're on. Would you like to share a little bit about your work? Hi, yeah. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so my work is based in um, exploring concepts of uh, place, belonging, and what connects us as beings. Um, with our time on this planet in this dimension. Um, I talk about, um, well, I explore my Punjabi ancestral history and Punjab is um, the Northern part of India and it borders Pakistan, what is now called Pakistan and what was now, what is now called India. Um, and this is my most, these two pieces that I have in the show are one of my most recent works um, and they were expired, inspired by my uh, grandfather, who likes to tell me stories about um, his life as a boy through persecution, um, immigra immigration, and um, just tell me stories of his life through so many different events. Um, and one of the things that he always talks about is the love of his life, his, my grandmother, who passed away three years ago. Um, and after she passed away, I think I became obsessed with what pre preservation meant and um, um, especially in stories where I feel like grandmothers and mothers are forgotten and kind of reclaiming those stories um, about crossing oceans, um, immigration, and just to give their children a better life and how those stories are vital for our survival, our languages, um, and all that is natural around us. Um, so this was inspired by my great-grandmother um, from my mom's side and um, how those tree rings, um, how aging and all of those things are just stories we need to reclaim. And this is a piece, I call it Connected. Um, it started during the beginning of the pandemic where I was learning how um, our well-being is connected to the well-being of those around us. And seeing it so literally 
through everything that was happening during the pandemic and um, just kind of understanding that even pre-pandemic that we are still all connected. We're connected to the earth. We're connected to um, the plants, the animals, everything around us is deeply connected to our humanity. Um, and taking, a, taking care of each other community and having people around us is important. And um, that's what this piece was really about. And thank you so much for having me here. Of course. Thank you so much for having your work strengthen the show. Thank you for, for being here. And um, both you and Alexis, um, I forgot to mention this to you, Alexis, as well. If you would like to share your Instagram handles or any websites in the chat, that way folks are, um, are welcome to follow your work. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we also, I saw John Galan um, in the show or in the, the chat, if you're still here, John, and you wanted to share a little bit about your work. John has um, this thick here. Um, and then John also has the Selena with the lungs, which is here. Hi. And John has um, his third piece is uh, what we used for the cover of the exhibition, which is Abuelita. So if you are here, John, and you would like to speak on any of these, let me know. Sure, I can start off with this one since we're already on it. Hi everyone, my name is John Galan. Um, I, I know quite a few of you just through Instagram, so it's very neat and exciting to kind of see faces in person. Um, I hope we're all having a wonderful Friday and weekend. I know I am. School just finished for the day, so I'm a little wiped. <laughs> A little wiped out from teaching all day, but excited to be here. So for this work, and I think, I mean, the, the thing that kind of ties all of our works in the show is the fact that, right, we're, we're incorporating these brown bodies connected to nature. And so that's kind of one of the biggest underlying themes with my works is finding those connections. Um, and, and that's just tied to like, you know, early Mesoamerican ritualistic beliefs, um, you know, dating back all the way to when we, we first began agricultural settlement, et cetera. So a lot of that has to do with um, one person that I like to, to describe as like saying it pretty well is Carl Jung's, um, the psychoanalyst Carl Jung talks about the inextricable connection between humankind and the natural world. And so in many ways, I feel that the work that I create is about celebrating the human spirit, but also connecting to the natural world and how as we get older, we realize like everything is so connected. And I find that so beautiful. And I'm sure we all feel that same way too, right? That's why we're here. So um, for me, this work personally was just a little ode to my grandmother. She was, she passed away probably when I was 18 and this was my mom's mom and I used to call her abuelita and I'm, which I'm sure lots of us kind of did similar something like that but for me her name was abuelita I actually didn't I wasn't very close to her growing up because I didn't know Spanish growing up um and I had to learn but by the time I did learn she had already passed and um for me this work was just about celebrating her and all the triumphs that she's had in her life so essentially she's she raised my mom and her, her nine siblings pretty much almost on her own because my mom's dad died at six years old. And so they grew up very poor in Mexico, eating, you know, getting by with very little. And so I wanted to depict her in her age and in her wisdom, something that I, I don't see within our culture nowadays, you know. I think that's why we create what we create too, right? Is because we're not seeing brown bodies being depicted in our own culture and in American history too. So again, a lot of the work is connected to Mesoamerican roots and shamanistic beliefs, but it also is tied to contemporary thought and experiences of what um, at least my Chicano um, view is through the scope of um, 
you know, trying to connect with, with people now and to my past. And so for this work, it's kind of an ode to my grandma having to raise all these children on her own um, and then depicting imagery of plants that were just inspired by things that my mom likes. And so a lot of it was just like, I wanted to really describe um, in detail, like the views of her face and all that. So, yeah, you can go to any other work you want. It doesn't matter. I have that one with me behind me. I don't know if you can see my screen, but I brought it today just to say hi. Hi, Selena. So uh, this painting is called Selena y sus pulmones de nopal. And um, this is part of an ongoing ser series that I developed a couple of years ago. Originally, the um, pulmones de nopal, the cactus lungs were inspired by um, a, a relative who was going through a very, very hard time they had a sibling essentially end up in a hospital from anorexia. And then when that sibling finally came out, um, their parent ended up having a stroke. And so there was just a lot going on in the world. Um, and so my, the idea of creating the, the cactus lungs was a source of, of unconditional love for her but I also wanted to, to show my um, this person, this relative, that, that there was hope and resilience in what they were doing. So the cactus lungs was all about essentially, this person was going through lots of anxiety and they would tell me they felt like they couldn't breathe. And so that's where the whole idea came when I was looking at imagery of what, you know, is to the root of at least Mexican American heritage and what has been, you know, partaken throughout Aztec history, um, you see the nopal plant, right? It's even depicted on the flag. And so I wanted to use imagery that was already iconic to our culture, not only through Mexico, but the idea of lungs as well, and create a piece in which I'm literally um, using symbolism of like the the lungs and the cactus as a resilient plant to express to her that her ability to um, to withstand, you know, even the, the hardest things was, was very capable of that person. And so that we kind of came like this universal symbol in which I created not only cactus lungs, but a corn brain and a pomegranate heart connected to all those um, universal themes and motifs within my work, which now carry on to works like this, where I wanted to continue to describe those um, emotions and symbols in, in ways in which I can reinvent stuff that's already part of our society just to kind of connect with with people who aren't so familiar with art either so that I wanted to do an icon which is something that I don't do too often but something I was very interested in um, once again to really try and connect to to my own culture and to bring awareness of art just to, to the everyday person who doesn't really understand other works that they might not know imagery of. So that's what that works about. Sorry if I'm talking a lot. <laughs> I'm a teacher, so I talk all day. I'm just blah, blah, blah. It's okay. And then actually, if you want to just briefly talk about these, um, John, just because we do have a few other artists that you need to speak. Totally. Um, you wanted to, to briefly touch on this diptych? Yeah, so the diptych is a self-portrait of myself and my father, and it was created while I was in the countryside of Portugal at an artist residency in 2016. And the whole idea was it started off with me taking a selfie um, in the literally the countryside. It was absolutely wonderful. And it was, you know, the transition of spring into summer. And it happened during that month while I was there. So there were all these flowers and then a few weeks later it turned into summer. And so it was a great experience um, during June while I was there. And essentially I wanted to continue to connect with that idea of the inextricable connection between humankind and the natural world. And one way in which I did that was just, you know, painting myself feeling at peace for the first time, being able to travel. And um, right away, it reminded me of this, how I could use seasons as a, a main motif and 
to describe uh, one's own personality in youth. And so lots of times, whether it's through literary context or whatever it is, essentially springtime can be viewed as something usually that's fertile, right? Youth is fertile. It represents um, growth, beauty, et cetera. Not that I was seeing myself as a beautiful person, <laughs> but the fact that the idea of being young and, and feeling optimistic in life in that sense was the idea of beauty within youth and optimism. And then I wanted to create, I painted the, the following photo of my father. So the one in me was green, I called it green, and this one is called gold. And so I got a lot of criticism at the beginning of this work just because it was like, looked like it was dead hay essentially, but in, in many ways the interpretation was gold and that the sense you have my father who's this elderly wisdom um, being portrayed during the summertime when you harvest wheat. And so the whole idea was like with this age, you are seeing like physical imagery of not only wisdom, but the ability to provide for family. And so that's what these works were about. And I just like to big, give shout out to everyone who um, is a part of the show, as well as the director because it, it has been such a privilege to be able to come out here and talk today. So thank you all so much. Thank you for being here, John. And again, if you'd like to, to drop your handles, your, um, your website, all of those into the chat, that way folks have access to you post um, the show. They can um, definitely do that. And Tina, has these three pieces. Tina, would you like to, or Tina, I'm sorry, would you like to um, share a little bit about your work? I forgot, yeah, unmute. Um, <laughs> yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm getting to my Mimi's time almost, so <laughs> I'll try to, I'll keep it brief, but um, these works are embroidery. Um, I do uh, painting and drawing, but for some reason I'm really drawn to fibers um, and fabric and just sort of like incorporating fibers into my work. Um, and I really love the, um, the, the, the kind of uh, feeling you get, the, the hand quality, the handmade quality of it, um, feeling the artist's hand in the work. Um, so I'm not really, I'm not a sewer. I don't sew, <laughs> but I think some people might argue with me. I, um, I really love that quality of, of seeing the thread and the color of it. And um, I incorporated watercolor for the faces. And I was just really interested, or I am interested in uh, especially women um, and women within our culture and everything that all the artists are saying about identity is really resonating with me because I too feel that disconnect from my culture and from my indigenous heritage and my ancestry. And just, um, I don't have any traditions or cultural traditions from my family, uh, not very much, but uh, I know I'm indigenous and um, cause I took a blood test uh, but uh, I don't have it. I don't know the tribes and I don't know anything. It's, it's just a complete disconnect. And so it, I feel the pain of that loss. And I think a lot of us do. And we feel that loss like we don't belong. And that's where that comes from. And so I, I feel like I'm always trying to connect back to the culture, to some kind of culture. But I think with, with these particular pieces, um, they were about women. Um, they were about how women are strong in the face of, of so much like within the past year with the pandemic and uh, with uh, all the protesting and mostly women, women are always in the thick of and they're always the backbone for lots of just everything, just family and life and we, instead of holding us up as queens, they push us down and they take away the rights to our to our bodies. And, you know, I grew up here in Texas and it's just a, and a painful, I feel almost violated myself that they, they pass these laws 
that control our bodies. And so it's just so heart wrenching um, to think that they don't, you know, how they hold us in, in disrespect. So I just want to uphold women and, and put them to the top. And I see them as these strong, you know, just beautiful creatures. We just, I mean, we just are. And so I, I uh, incorporate them into my work and I try to show how beautiful and how strong and powerful we really are. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, shout out to all of the, the mujeres, the femmes in the world holding space and honestly, just like making shit happen. So um, yes, yes, yes. Um, Ashley. Are you um, on, Ashley? Would you like to share a little bit about your work? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm moving rooms right now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm just going to stand over here in the hall for a minute. Um, first, I'm super, super honored, super excited to be included in this group. Um, and when I saw the call for submissions, uh, I was really excited because um, bodies have been just a huge topic of like interest for painting and for art for me lately it's like as um as a way to really reconnect with ourselves and with our bodies I think a lot of times um especially growing up with really Christian backgrounds or things like that we talk a lot about like um only spirit or only this but like our bodies are where we live like this is who we are and especially talking about black and brown bodies and plants is um the more I talk with people the more I realize how many of us grew up within the system of white supremacy and patriarchy that gives us like such standards that we think we have to be held to um so we don't know how beautiful we are we don't realize I know that sounds so cheesy but it's so true we don't realize our power and our strength and just like the gloriousness of bodies um and so this one this body is a miracle is this process this long ass hard difficult um journey of coming to understanding like the power and the beauty in my body and like everything that has gone into it all of my ancestors the way that like the miracle of me um and yeah, just that process. And so I often paint over canvases when I'm not happy. I just like keep painting and keep painting. And this one um, was one that I worked on so many different times, could not find something. And so um, if you like look really closely, it's incredibly textured and that's just from all the layers of paint. And so I kind of really connected that with um, that kind of process of growth, um, the practice of learning to love our bodies, learning to see ourselves as beautiful, learning to, um, yeah, take hold of our own power uh, in this world that we live in. Um, so, yeah, and then the one other, um, my kind of body obsession was really influenced by a friend who was uh, reclaiming their own sexuality. And so they were like, hey, do you think you can paint a nude of me? And I'm like, oh, I've never done that before, but I would absolutely love to try. Um, and so it was, uh, yeah, I was really honored to be trusted with that. Um, and so, yeah, it was just like showcasing this like beauty and this um, owning of our own sexuality, especially women, especially brown women, especially um, where I am in the South, uh, is just not a thing. And so, just getting to express that really boldly uh, through painting. And then, yeah, of course, the connection with plants, like the vibrancy, the life, the growth, the strength, the resiliency, all of these words, like that is who we are. That's our bodies. Like that is what we go through so much. We go through so much. Um, plants go through so much, but also like find the ways to get what they need and to thrive and to grow. And that's who we are. And that's our people. Um, so yeah, thank you so much again for putting this together and for including me. Thank you so, so much, uh, Ashley, for sharing. And uh, again, if I missed any of the artists to share your handles, um, websites, anything in the chat, please feel free to do that. Um, so yes, um, Lauren, are you on Lauren? And would you like to, to share a little bit about your work? Hi all, um, so, so, much gratitude just being in this space. Um, just the work has been phenomenal. Um, just a connection to spirit. 
Uh, this piece uh, that I did is called Mother in Nature. Um, it's interesting because it's it sat in my closet um, for about five years. I started it when I was pregnant with my son, who's now six years old. And I just, I, I had the tree, I had the idea of a woman, um, but it wasn't realized. Um, and, and I don't know if it's simply <laughs> me going through motherhood myself um, to really kind of understand that piece. Um, but it, for me, as a, as a Black woman in uh, growing up in the States, um, having my ancestry come through the slave trade, understanding that of being displaced um, as part of the diaspora. Um, this one spoke to me because it was a woman um, in many spaces, black and brown women are forced to create this world. Um, and you see, she's got a full belly and in that belly is this world. Um, but she's not only nurturing this belly, in darkness. Um, and so that really spoke to me is um, many times we're, we're given lemons and expected to make lemonade, but sometimes we're given shit, sorry, <laughs> and expected to make lemonade. Um, and so that was that was really crucial here. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to really make a point of um, is having that moonlight in the corner is that even in that darkness, there is that still light. Um, that helps bring forth life. Um, so that's this piece. Beautiful, Lauren. Thank you so much for strengthening the, the exhibit with your work. Um, it's, yeah, when we saw this piece, we, we immediately thought it was super powerful. So thank you so much. Um, Vilma, since we are here, Vilma, are you, um, are you on? And would you like to share a little bit about your work? No, okay. Um, we also have, um, oops. come on. We also have um, Thoria. Thoria, would you like to share a little bit about your work? And um, Thoria has this piece here. They also have one or two other pieces. Let me find them, I'm sorry. I thought it had the exhibition memorized. Here we go. This is uh, the other piece by Thoria. And yeah, sure. Thoria also has this piece right over here. And maybe we can start with this piece since we're over here, Thoria. But take it away. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is my pride and joy right here. Um, so initially, when I made this painting, it was really to formally come out as non binary. Um, it was really only my family that wasn't aware of how I, was, like, how I was identifying. And this was like one of the first shows that I invited them to, to like come out, but like not come out. The whole concept of coming out is already like enough for me, but, um, but yeah, so when I created this, it was really, I was really at a time where I was struggling with how to be, vulnerable and not just vulnerable about intimacy, but vulnerable just about my gender, um, just about my identity in general. And I love what all the other, other artists today have mentioned about this connection or disconnect with identity and self, because I totally feel that. And with this piece, it was like, I particularly chose this stance because most of the time people see it as like, this confidence, this like, this like strength. But in reality, for me, it's like, it took me a long time to realize I use that stance to deal with my dysphoria. You know, like I perceive myself a certain way and really my dysphoria comes from like a social standpoint more than a personal one. And it's how the world perceives me and how I wish I could be perceived and yeah, so this was like a really intimate piece for me, a very personal one for me. And when I, um, <laughs> one of the comments, um, anyway, so with this piece, I was in the middle of like incorporating a lot of like plant and nature and different colors. I was really like playing around with this symbolism that, you know, different plants and 
flowers offer. And a lot of times when I think about my gender, I think about my childhood. And in my childhood, you know, as kids, we used to play with, you know, the plants outside in our backyard and the dirt and, you know, all that. And one of the flowers that we had in my backyard were these passion flowers. And I was that kid that would like literally pick apart those, you know, and, and I didn't realize how much it would have an impact on me. And so what I like to do when I start a painting is I do like a lot of research. I like to research the symbolism between colors and, and plants and nature, like I was saying, and, you know, different poses and stuff. So when I looked up the passion flower, like I immediately connected it to my non-binary identity, you know, because the colors are usually lavender and yellow and orange and like it's just so this vibrancy that was also I would find in non-binary flags and genderqueer flags and so I always have this like light bulb <laughs> that turns on when I connect these things and I'm like I have to make it you, regardless if it makes sense to anybody else I'm gonna go for it you know and and so I did and you know, the thing that I love about portraiture, painting portraits really is like how intimate that process is for me, especially doing self portraits. Like even when I'm doing other people's portraits, there's always a little bit of me in those portraits, regardless if I'm like conscious of it or not. But, but yeah, for this piece, it's like, it was really like setting the foundation of like, this is my identity. This is how, this is who I am pretty much. And it, you can take all the negative and the positive and, cause again, like I'm talking about masculinity and femininity and like I'm seeing it as I can define those things the way that I want to. Not just how other people do it, but how I want to be defined and how I define these things. Cause like we're talking about white supremacy is a bitch and colonial is a bitch and, this is me kind of like not just breaking the binary, but really just like existing as I am and has and as how I'm growing and has how I'm constantly changing in a way that like plants teach us so much of like who we are, how how I mean, all to say that like we have so much to learn from plants. That's what I was trying to say. So <laughs> Great. Would you like to share a little bit about the other pieces, Toria, or um, yeah, sure. one or the other? Do you have a preference? Um, either one. It doesn't matter. They're both kind of related. So for this piece, um, I, so during quarantine, I started on a series that was based on self-love. And it was such like a weird timing just because I had started the self-love series before quarantine started. And so when once quarantine hit, like it was a roller coaster of emotions, of identity problems, you know, like everything. And so when I this was like, I want to say around November where I was making this. So anyway, the the whole premise for this piece is when I, when I'm feeling such a way where I'm resentful of myself, resentful of the people around me, that's when I know I need to take time for myself. And I need to mind my own damn business and take care of myself, <laughs> which is why like, you know, one of the, 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 the title for it. And really like, it's me. So, so this is referenced from a photo I took of myself at my dad's cemetery. And not to sound cryptic or anything like that, but that's like a place I go to when I, really need to reconnect with myself. I need to reconnect with my lost loved ones. And this one is really just to talk about, you know, coping with, you know, COVID and coping with grief and coping with all the ways in which like I keep pouring from an empty cup, you know? And so this was very therapeutic for me and art for a long time was not therapeutic. You know, before COVID it was very much work oriented. And, you know, COVID, I'm not never going to say it was a blessing, but it definitely forced me to look inwards. So. Beautiful. <laughs> and Toria also has this other piece. If you'd like to briefly touch on it, you're welcome to Toria. Um, yeah. Or not, but oh, here we go. 
so this particular piece I made um, a few years back while I was still in school. And at this point in my life, I was really navigating the loss of my father. And pretty, like, pretty much I fabricated this image to make it look like as if it were present day, because that's, this is the kind of image that would never happen today. You know, like he passed when I was just turning nine years old. And, you know, when I hear other artists talk about how they have this disconnect with their Latinx heritage, I feel like in a way that's why I'm clutching on so much to my father because he makes up that Chicano heritage, that Mexican heritage that I felt like I could never connect to. You know, like I'm raised by a mother who's half Japanese, half white. You know, and so like so many times I feel like it's not just the loss of my father, it's the loss of my identity, it's the loss of my roots, it's the loss of, you know, these things that like I can't, like I'm still dealing with as of today, you know, and so the reason for the agave plant in the background is in my parents, um, at my parents' house, we have this agave plant that's been there for years since I was one, you know, and learning about agave plants, like I learned that once there's like that, you know, the huge, beautiful bloom, the, it, the initial plant dies out. But with that, with the bloom, you know, deteriorate, deteriorating, like there's these seeds that end up growing so much more. So like, I don't know, I connected that to like my feelings about my father, my, my feelings of like keeping, like this idea of like desperately seeking roots. You know, like, although there's such a disconnect, it doesn't have to die off, you know? So that's just a little bit about what that means for me. Thank you so much for sharing, Bodia, your, your story is so powerful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And I saw in the comments too, that we have Natalia Sotelo, um, who's visiting all the way from Ciudad de Mexico. Um, and I know that there's a, a time difference there. So I want, to, um, I want to go to your pieces next, Natalia. Um, and Natalia, you're welcome to speak in English or también puedes hablar en español como sea más fácil para ti. Um, that way, if you need to also jump off of the call because it's late where you are, um, you can do that. Hi, yeah, thank you so much. Creo que me igual y puedo hacer como poquito de Spanglish o algo así. Y creo que, like, I accidentally shared the links wrong. So there's like a couple me's that are not actually me, but like they are me, like, the people I shared it with. <laughs> um, anyway, so to get started, uh, my name is Natalia Sotelo. I'm an uh, artist from Mexico City. I was born and raised there. And then I moved to the US. My mom is from Seattle, but I, yeah, was born and raised in Mexico City. I, and a lot of work kind of involves both places in a way. So actually, could we go to the piece, the other piece, the one that, um, I have right behind me. So this one started because growing up in Mexico City, you know, you take history classes and you um, learn about uh, like, yeah, just the history and like what every, where everyone comes from and just all the different cultures that are over there. And growing up there from like K to 12, we were taught about all the, I, I'm really interested in, um, the belief system. So we were taught about all of the gods and goddesses uh, or what people believed in back then. And I real I didn't realize it back then, but when I moved here I to Seattle, I took a class called Mexican Women Past and Present. And in that class, I learned about all the women and the goddesses that existed and that were believed in but I, I never knew anything about I didn't hear one single word about them growing up like from k to 12 and I was just really confused because um, I was always really interested in learning about them and seeing just like the belief difference in belief systems from back then to now and I was surprised how I had to learn about all these impressive women and or goddesses and by coming to the US and taking a class here specifically on that and that like it was never really taught over there so that confused me a lot and that's how it started that I wanted to show for um, women who have been forgotten by history 
and especially so this is a piece and it's called Diosa Mayawel who is the goddess of the Mayays so that's what um, I depicted her with all the plants and the flowers around her and her color is blue I did some research on her and yeah she's just like a really powerful being that still has like a lot of impact on our world today like everything that comes from the Mayays and you know when you um different parts of Mexico still have it a lot so so I was just that's where it came from I wanted to start a series about um yeah women who I didn't see you growing up or identify with and even hearing other people talking here today like Tina was saying how um yeah like how she didn't really know about like um very ancient cultures and histories like that and that made me work like I want to show others what we're kind of forgetting about and we don't really know about so yeah, this is what this piece is about. And I also incorporated some like little aspects about nature. Um, and yeah, we could go to the other ones. And then the other ones are also about kind of culture in Mexico and Mexico City and also combined with how women grew up in the patriarch, like a part patriarchal, el patriarcado, you know, uh, system. So this one is about they're they're kind of right next to each other and the red one um she's pointing and kind of like in a gun like motion to the other woman right next to her and there's like a figure coming from the back and that kind of represents society and del patriarcado and like um all the people that are kind of influencing her telling her what's going on, what to do, and how women are also brought against each other. Um, it has only become more recent that women are like uh, pumping each other up more openly and uh, doing stuff like that. But growing up and even before, um, yeah, it was like a lot of hate or like comparison against women to, towards each other and for example like really one weird really example that I can remember is when like in a couple and when the guy like cheats on the on the girl and the girl is like finds out and she goes against the other girl for some reason like the, the person who like the other woman and that always made me so confused I was like why <laughs> what did she have to do like she didn't even know about that like she had no idea why aren't we like holding that person who was actually for their actions like why do we have to bring women against each other like that so this is kind of representing that because she is pointing towards the other um woman on the side the yeah the green one and kind of like I try to make it a little bit surrealistic with the doors kind of like she's pointing directly at her but at the same time it's kind of through the door that we might not really see so that's a lot about my work that has to do with like women the patriarchy and growing up in different oh I mean like growing up in Mexico City and then learning about different things um like that so yeah I hope um I can keep doing that and I'm I feel so honored to be here in this space because currently I'm going through an art block so seeing all the other artists and like the art just like it, it's a way to get out of the art block so thank you thank you so much Natalia and I've also made a note to flip the pieces so that they're pointing in the right direction so know that tomorrow it'll it'll get fixed uh, okay <laughs> thank you thank I you for that mistake um, and then um, we also have Michelle Torres. Uh, Michelle, are you on? And would you like to share a little bit about your work? Michelle has three pieces in this as well. And yes, I would love to share my work. So hi, everyone. My name is Michelle, and I'm going to go ahead and talk to you guys about my series, The Arborist. Um, this work is, comes from a very personal place in my life. And the way it started off is that I... I, um, when I first started as an artist, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I didn't know what media spoke to me the most. So I was leaning towards traditional because that's what I started off with. And I didn't digital because I didn't have access to that. 
Um, it wasn't until I went to the University of Arlington where I took my first digital class. And then they were putting pressure on me, like you have to pick a direction in which way you wanna go. And so um, the following semester is one I was obligated to. I took my first painting class that semester, but I was still afraid to say, oh, hey, I wanna be a painter. So I chose digital for the fall. That same spring semester, I, I was bold enough to sell my paintings and I, I said, hey, on Snapchat, if anybody wants any paintings, um, I'll do nine, nine by 12s for 50 bucks on canvas paper. And of the three offers that I got, one I will never forget. And he is the one I'm talking about. Uh, so a friend of mine said, hey, I, I know somebody, I showed them your work and they would really like for you to make this painting. And I said, oh yeah, sure, why not? So I made it for them. I never gave it to them in person, but later down the line, they followed me on social media and I became friends with them. And I did meet up with them in person. And I remember he was, he was telling me, oh, hey, you know, I hope you don't mind. I'm actually an arborist. And I'm like, well, what does that matter? I'm like, it's because you're really cool, you know? And I'm like, oh, no, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't it has nothing to do with um, anything, you know? To me, if you're a friend, you're a friend. And I got really close to him. And one day he told me, hey, I have something to tell you. And I said, what? He said, one day I might have to say goodbye to you. And I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, um, I'm actually, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I'm sentenced for deportation. And I said, oh, he was framed for something he did not do. So he was not always an arborist, but he had to become one because he still had to support himself. So that semester when I was doing graphic design, he was taken away and I never got to say goodbye to him. So, um, we had a phone call and man, that, that phone call still, it still hurts me to this day. I wanted to go see him so badly. And he said, I can't let you do that. He said, I know, I know your, I know your heart and I can't let you come here because I cannot allow you to rob your own opportunities to come see me. And he told me, I am no one compared to you. He said, Mish, I want you to know something. I hope you know that you deserve the world and more. And I hope one day you can shine for me. And I, be, and, um, I said, I don't know if I can do that, but I'll do my best. And I switched majors because I could not connect to, to graphic design at all. So we later reconnected again and I told, he's like, hey, what's up? And I said, I told him that I had switched my majors to painting. And we were talking about a lot of the injustices that he went through as an arborist and like the things that we still go through in the community that are not spoken enough about. And I said, do you happen to have any photographs of when you were an arborist and of your coworkers? And he said, yes, I do. He said, can I, can I, can I please use them? Uh, can I make paintings of them? And he said, absolutely. As long as, you know, he remained anonymous and respect his privacy. When I first started off with this series, you know, I, I think I was just going in with my pure emotions, like the anger that I felt, the loss, the despair. Um, but what I kept in mind is that I didn't want these to just be replicas of the photographs that he gave me. I wanted to bring in the humanity of these individuals and of him, the humanization of undocumented workers. And I even kept that in mind with the title. I didn't want to just say, oh, the undocumented workers. I called him the arborist. That is a title. That is um, who they are. Because I feel like the word undocumented is just reinforcing this invisibility that they want upon us. And I'm like, no, we're not invisible. We're right here. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is that I play a lot with perspective in my paintings. 
So in a literal sense, but also metaphorically, like I'm changing the, the, my audience's views, like where he's way up high in a palm tree. I'm making you think about how high up is he? And then the second one, which is this one right here, I'm literally putting you in his shoes. So not only are you seeing the perspective of how high up he is, but what do you think he feels when he's up there? Like these people have to go home to their families every day. So cutting trees is actually a pretty dangerous job. Um, not only that, um, a lot of the photographs that he gave me, they were set in Victory Park. So those are really rich neighborhoods in Dallas, Texas. And one thing that's really important is that they don't always know who they're going to work with. So a lot of times that these neighbors have petty arguments over each other. So let's say that they, they're cutting this tree and a branch falls on the wrong side of the fence. That neighbor just to get revenge on the other neighbor, like, well, I'm gonna call ICE. And so it's at ex the expense of them, but without their work, these their beautiful gardens would not exist. They need us or they hire us. So that's really what my work is about. And as I continue forward with each piece, I keep that in mind. Thank you so much for sharing, um, Michelle, those powerful stories. And you are shining, you're shining today, girl. So yes, um, and, and yeah, thank you. Thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing those stories. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and next we actually have Adrian, Adrian Delgado, are you on? And would you like to share a little bit about your work? Hi, I'm on. This is- are you okay? Yes, hello, this is Adrian. Adrian has a few pieces in the show. Um, he has this piece here. If you'd like to start here, Adrian. Can I start with the, the, the flower carriers? Of course. Because that one's like an earlier one. Um, so my name's Adrian Delgado. Um, I've been really good friends and following El Camelito since they started. I can see myself now. Since they started, uh, they're all, they're, they're collective. Uh, so it's always an honor to be, be in their shows and just see the people they follow because I feel like I, I learned so much, even these artists who just started, like, like I feel like I learned so much more from seeing these artists who are just starting, who are essentially emerging, um, even though it seems like we never stop emerging. Uh, but I, I work as, a, as an art handler at SF MoMA and I often feel like I don't co connect to the work and it's sad, I mean, I, don't, I, I guess it's not sad. I, I feel like it's crazy that people who show there are considered masters, but I don't consider them masterful at all half the time because I don't see any connection to me in those works. And seeing the works here, I feel like there's so much more masterful pieces here than, than at work. Like I get more inspired from seeing the works here. And um, I don't know, but anyway, <laughs> uh, this, this, this is a piece I did in uh, 2017. Um, and this is kind of like a little bit after I finished uh, going to art school and going to art school, I kind of dealt with, I guess, I don't know what it's called. I mean, I know there's a word for it, but like this, this racism that is, it, it, it's, it's there, but it isn't directed in your face. And at the time I kind of realized how much of a privilege going to art school was. And not only how much of a privilege it was, but really, really understanding like what my parents went through to give me a better life. Um, and kind of the goal with my work is to really look around my, around in my surroundings and see those people who remind me of my parents and give them uh, a temple. And when I say a temple, I think of the gallery space as a temple because it's a place we go to see things to worship, to see things to honor to see things that that we want to last forever because I think that's what art is it's, it's something that that is documented and something that that is is meant to, to be history right or or history or you know however you want to say it but or they you know what, whatever you want to doc, like say it as but I feel like for for me I wanted to honor these people and I wanted to really give them light and to be honest I feel like I've learned so much about myself from making these works than than making like works that are not directed towards those people who are my parents because it's when we look at our family and what they've experienced that we really see what we're going to experience and uh actually a few a month ago a month and a half ago I, I i have my own kid she's actually six months old she told me to mention her 
Um, <laughs> she's looking at me right now. Uh, but anyway, like it's become completely full circle and thinking about not only my parents, but the parent I want to be. And I feel like it's, it's, it's seriously like crazy. Like I was really scared of having kids, to be honest, in my twenties, because I thought it would hold me back from making artwork because, you know, like before this, I would say my, my works are my, my children. Right. Um, but I don't want to keep them, want to give them away and so, not give them away, but sell them and, you know, have them move out of the house as soon as possible because I can make more work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I could go on. Uh, but anyway, uh, this, this is a piece that I did for a series. Oh, she's talking right now. This is a series I did for a show that I did that was called uh, Contra Contraposto. And it's, uh, it was made for this gallery space in the Oakland that's no longer uh, around. It's called Tentus Contemporary. And it was uh, a series of work that was based off uh, this, this, uh, this word called Contraposto, which is meant to ex describe kind of the works of, of like classical art. Um, and I always kind of like try to look at history and like reintroduce it so that it makes sense to not only myself, but to like people who don't always look at art. And I try to introduce them in a very like digestible way. Um, but the idea is that when I, the idea is that when, when I look at uh, people working and I see people uh, like selling fruit, uh, construction workers, there's this kind of mindset that that I wish I had. And it's a very, uh, to be relaxed and to be ready for work at the same time. Um, and I think I've been trying to be better at that because I get so anxious and I just I just want to always create. I can't sit down. Um, but it's based off the sculpture of David. Like he has this kind of like a like posture where one leg's up and the other one's kind of like ready to work. Um, so within this series, there's there's that element of of that mindset. And with this piece, it was also uh, inspired by the by the piece by Dio Rivera called Flower Carriers. But this one's called Garbage Carriers. And it's kind of like a modern day version of that where I, I always look at these people and I think they adapt to their surroundings. And when I think about plants, I think about my parents because they they're, they always had plants around. Like when I look at nopales, I think, oh, my, my, my mom's down there like cutting nopales and, you know, cutting those, those, those tunas. And uh, like there's just this connection to it. And I, I think I'm still trying to figure it out. Like even in my house, I have this obsession with plants. And I, I don't know if it's because it reminds us of how delicate life is. I think I'm still trying to figure it out. And that's why I kind of had this obsession with, with uh, trying to keep them alive. <laughs> um, but let's, let's, but uh, anyway, um, the newer works I've been working on, I kind of started in the pandemic and it was kind of rough that, I mean, not rough, but I was really trying really hard not to make work about temp pandemic because I just know there were so many artists doing about doing works about that. But I think I, I kind of put myself in that in that position where I was like, okay, I I'm making works about it even though I'm not trying. And these two pieces, uh, these are both called the uh, Dolor Dolores Park um, one and two, and and because I I call them one and two because it's it's the same day and this is actually uh, photos taken on my anniversary uh, two years ago. I don't even remember how long this pandemic has been, but this is during the start of it where we went to Dolores Park. And I noticed that there was these people selling uh, selling ice cream, selling fruits and whatever they can. And seeing that no matter what, you know, no matter how crazy this pandemic has gone, these people are still working. These people are still making a living. These people are still out there. Like they don't, they don't have the ability to work from home like I do. And I, and this one you can see the, the person's back. And the other reason why I do, I do a lot of these portraits from their back is it's meant to, to show these people kind of the way uh, Americans often see them and that's to turn their back against them and kind of forget them and make them kind of dehumanize. But I try to really try to give them like, again, this space to honor them. And, and as you can see, like he kind of has this relaxed but also like intense pose and uh, I, I, I kind of have this, this this nostalgic element in my work that that is always coming on and off, and I don't know. It just it just it's a way to see myself from seeing like these people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I it was kind of hard for me to avoid making works about the pandemic. It was 
impossible because <laughs> I, I, I consider myself to be somebody who, who kind of uh, documents my surroundings. Um, and even by making portraits of my neighborhood, which I would just take pictures of trash cans and make, make paintings of trash cans, I, I still like, it still had this element of, of, uh, of the, what was going on today. Um, but yeah. I don't know if there's any questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for sharing, um, Adrian. And if you also want to drop your info um, in the chat, you are welcome to. Um, and then, Livia, are you still on? Would you like to talk about um, We Are All Juan Gas, which also made an appearance in Pepe's poem? Yes, hi. Um, give me one moment. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you know, first of all, I want to say thank you to Edgar and Abel for creating this um, space for everyone to come together, especially air, like Latinx community. And I think it's very important to capture that. And um, thank you. And for thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Lydia Olvera. I am a Latinx um, queer artist. I'm new to the art scene. I just started recently painting four years ago and this all evolved after my dad passed away and it was the way it was my outlet to um to let my grief out and throughout the years my my technique has changed and I think that's the beautiful part of painting you know we we evolve and we use that feeling to keep push, pushing, you know, we keep creating even more, even if it's different than what you started. And even though sometimes you have no idea where it's going, but you just keep going and going and going and just waking up and having that brush in your hand and just painting. But um, as this is Juan Graviel, as most of you may know, um, also known as Juanga and he is a Latinx um, artist, and he is well known for many love songs and epic songs that we may sing um, when we're gathered together. And one of the things that for me as um, growing up is I heard Juan Graver a lot waking up in the mornings. and. It was my parents cleaning. It was their day off. That's how I knew it was my, my parents' day off. They weren't off on the weekends. And as they were off different days out of the week, and I knew that once they played music in the background, it was their day off. And it was nice to see them be happy and just to be home. And to me, that's a childhood like memory that I've always have taken with me. And throughout time, um, I would say that it wasn't until I got older and I moved out of my parents' house that I started appreciating the music, the real passion behind this music. And it was something that I took with me. And I started listening to his albums on my own. And it's, I created a home away from home. And I think it's a hard thing to do, you know, you're first gen and as much as your parents want you to stay home and just kind of like keep you safe, like I feel like I had to make a critical decision, you know, that I needed to, to move and create a career and I wanted to break the barriers of generations that um, we have upon us. And um, so this is, I created this this year and I've created a series of Juan Gravio since last year during the pandemic. And I love painting Juan Gravio for many reasons. And I love capturing his emotions of Amor Eterno. So if you listen to the lyrics and you listen to the music, it's like very, it's poetic, it's powerful, and I, I can never get tired of it, you know? And to me, you know, como dicen, cuando los mexicanos cantan, lloramos, ¿verdad? And when Mexicans sing, we cry. And it's because of the passion that we have within us. And we have so much emotion bottled in 
you know, and we just want to break away from that because, you know, growing up, we never, it was hard to, for our parents to teach us how to like talk about emotion or be me, mijo, what are you feeling? You know, it, it's really hard. And I think that through music, that's how we communicate, you know? And um, I wanted to portray him and I was inspired by Amor Eterno. And especially his eyes, if you look at his eyes, it's something that many of us can relate to, the sorrow, the, the pain, you know, charisma for life, but also like just feeling the loss of someone that we lost. And for me, that was my father. And I can see his pain through, like I can see my pain through his eyes. So that's just, this is what I wanted to um, portray for um, Juan Graviel. So that's why I named it we're all Juangas because one way or the other, we, we, um, we can relate to him. So, yeah. Beautiful piece, Lydia. Thank you so, so much. And also Thank you. Um, please include your, your social media handles and any other um, handles that you'd like to to include and thank you all. Um, we're almost finished. We just have a few more artists. So thank you all for your patience and for sitting and listening to these powerful stories. The storytelling today has been really beautiful. So thank you to all of the artists. Tokayo, Edgar, are you on? And would you like to share a little bit about um, this four photograph series? Yes, I'm on. Um, hello, my name is Edgar Perez Pena. I am a primarily a painter, but I also like to explore in photography, assemblage, um, performance as well. I'm currently a second year um, MFA grad student at Cal State San Bernardino. Um, but um, this series right here um, named Mi Cuerpo Siente, Mi Cuerpo Siente Dolor, um, it's a series that I done, I would say, two, a year or two ago. Um, I believe it was a year because during that time, I was still trying to come out to myself. Um, this series mostly explores metaphorically the tree branch as, a, I would say, as a metaphor for a family tree and also the toxicities that I was surrounded by when it comes to social structures. Like as a male, I'm already born with a given image of what I'm supposed to portray and what I'm supposed to follow. And remembering growing up as a you know young boy, I'm playing with my neighbors like dolls and having a male confront me and tell me that my genitalia is gonna fall off if I play with these dolls. So it was kind of traumatic. Um, and also throughout time and taking a lot of art history courses and just absorbing and observing our performances when it comes to dialogue and our environments and how that changes and also how we view each other and treat each other on how we create politics through the land, politics through borders. And so currently my work is evolving such as myself um, it's transcontinental. Um, I identify as a queer Latinx Chicanx um, artist um, with Mi Cuerpo Siente Dolor. It took me further into thinking about the disconnect that I have within queer gay culture in the US as well as queer and gay culture on the other side of the border. I'm half Salvadoran and US. Um, so I stand between two pieces of uh, two two different worlds that I don't feel connected with, and so with my work, especially with Mi um, Cuerpo Siente Dolor, it's where I'm taking an object of the tree branch, which is this uh, masculine um, object. Um, it's the root. It's the foundation um, of a family, and I believe that from observant and like just by social media, the male figure is the foundation of a family followed by like everybody else, which is like, just say my siblings. Um, so coming out wasn't really taken well. <laughs> so, and also being uh, visually, uh, I mean, and seeing other behavioral problems of men in my life or men um, 
that I would be interacting with, um, it was just very toxic. And I decided to not perform that or repeat that. So therefore I cut this branch of the toxicities, but throughout my life, hence the tree branch on my back, it's just a performance as well in which I'm, I was forced to carry this lineage of what it is to be a man. But through that performance, I'm going on to the other pieces, I'm actually engraving my body with the tree branch itself. I actually have scars and like I bled through this piece in which I felt pain, discomfort, as well as I was also lost. I didn't like myself. I didn't like my body in which it wasn't portraying a stereotypical social structural image of what it is to be a male, especially when it comes to being a person of color in which not only do we have to face racism, but we also face like other, um, I, I also have to face homophobia. And so that led to a dysmorphia of my image and my loss of identity. And so through this piece, I pretty much learned how to resist as well as a healing process and strength. So, so this piece is touching up onto a lot of stuff, which is very intersectional, which is, a, which is a lot of the things that we are dealing with. Like everything that we deal with is intersectional. Like I am a male, I, I, I face demasculinization because I like other men, but also I'm queer. I also face homophobia. I'm also brown. I also face racism. And so this piece touches up on everything and um, my identity and reclaiming it and the pain and hurt and the strength and the performative aspect of our daily life. Um, yeah. So. Thank you so, so much, um, Edgar. These are really, really powerful. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for allowing us to include them in, in the exhibition. Cool, no, thank you for um, allowing me to be part of it. Um, this is actually the first time that I'm, you know, showing these images actually in an exhibition. Um, they came out in a publication in Curious Magazine at the Riverside Art Museum. Um, so it's pretty nice to have like a much wider audience um, viewing these. Thank you. Thank you for, yeah, that's awesome. And congrats on the publication. Um, Antonio, Antonio Alanis, are you on? And would you like to share a little bit about this um, self-portrait? I am. Buenas tardes a todos. How's everyone doing? Good. Um, awesome. First, thank you, Comalito Collective, for inviting me. Um, in the East Coast, I don't get many opportunities like these to spend time um, with artists who share similar backgrounds as mine. So thank you, um, everyone, for pouring um, all the feelings. I'm, I'm just like so happy to see everyone sharing this kind of artwork with, with us tonight. So my name is Antonio Alanis, and I'm an artist from Durham. North Carolina, and I'm presenting my self-portrait in 2021. 20, um, it's an oil, oil on canvas. It's a 12 inch by 16 inches. And the pandemic really was something that affected me, um, like many of us have expressed throughout. And I realized that it wasn't really as centered as I could have been. Um, I was living something that um, was not feeling who I was. And I wanted to use this painting to explain what I was going through and also make a sense of what I wanted to, to create and become. One quote that really um, kept popping into my mind every time that I was painting it for about a week, uh, actually took about three months or so, was um, the life is not really about finding us, but more about creating ourselves. And um, I really just kept going back to that quote to to, to recenter myself and, and really devote myself to, um, to artwork, right? Um, my life has been mostly in education. I, I am primarily a teacher, so shout out to all the educators throughout keeping all the nation afloat. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm very glad that I turned to art to um, explain a lot of the feelings that I was going through, particularly explain the feelings that make me feel um, alone and disconnected from my community around um, this uh, 
cataclysmic event. And I really want to um, uh, encourage everyone to keep keep fighting, keep going through this um, as, as much as we can. Um, and I just want to, uh, like many of you all have, have said, um, I want to document in this painting um, uh, our humanity, our, our optimism, and the drive for um, survival during um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I wanted to use my life um, a, as a, uh, another perspective to explain who we are and, and um, also celebrate uh, our resiliency, which is um, where this piece comes from, comes from a painting, um, a series called the, um, the visual, the Latinx visual resiliency series. And um, I just wanted to turn to the metaphor of plants, um, particularly around what everyone has said before, uh, the, the lessons they can teach us, um, particularly around survival and uh, thriving. Um, that's pretty much all what, what I would like to share today. Um, thank you all for the opportunity. And I look forward to, um, again, building this community. Um, spending time with you all tonight has been, again, amazing. Um, I would love to keep um, uh, making these conversations. And again, thank you, Comalito Collective, for, for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Antonio. Beautifully said. Um, and also, Antonio, if you'd like to share any websites or any social media handles, feel free to do that. Natalie Olaya, are you on? No? OK. Um, then we will take it away to Luis Garcia. Luis, are you still with us? No? OK. So um, I think that we are actually done. Are there any other artists who are um, on that didn't? I am, I, I'm sorry, Edgar. I am still here Okay. Just having technical difficulties. But you know, um, I could just go really quickly and just okay. go through um, one piece, if you like, um, uh, with Woven. Um, Thank you. We're just I just want to say thank you to all the artists, first and foremost. It's just been very beautiful work and just um, amazing stories and just uh, very, um, very powerful. But also I, I found a lot of connections and just, you know, like this piece is titled Woven. I just feel like there's a lot of woven uh, narratives that I connected to. And, um, you know, it's just it's just really great to have this kind of uh, venue and also just to hear people be able to speak and uh, hear their own uh, stories in that way and just see myself through them in some ways, but also um, uh, be able to appreciate where they're coming from as well. So uh, with this piece here, I'm from El Salvador as well. And uh, I just really want to say really quickly that um, although I consider myself Pipil and connected to an indigenous culture of Mesoamerican, um, I am very fully disconnected in a lot of ways. And so for me, there's a lot of romanticism put behind the work that I create in a way that uh, I'm trying to reconnect to a culture and a history that I really um, was not so fortunate to have been um, connected with in the way that I would have loved to in the sense that, um, you know, I, grew up in a very impoverished uh, community in Los Angeles and just like everyone else. Um, my parents were immigrants. I'm also an immigrant and uh, they came to this country and uh, just worked two or three jobs and didn't really have a lot of time to invest into cultural enrichment, you could say, and learning about a lot of different things. And there was also a lot of uh, assimilation that happened in the way that um, they had to really break uh, away from who they were in a lot of ways because of racism and the way things are in our uh, were and are still now in a lot of ways. And so for me, I am part of that offset, uh, part of that offspring in a way that I'm not connected as I'd like to be in a way. And so for me, the artwork uh, becomes a way for me to kind of reconnect. And it's also just a way for me to kind of um, have a um, way to document who I am and where I am and what I'm experiencing at this moment. And woven to me is just a piece that um, kind of connects to all those different little points that I just made in some ways. It's a, it's a piece that is uh, touching upon a family that I, I found this, this portrait of a family from the 1910s 
in El Salvador in the area where my uh, stepmother is from. Um, and she um, grew up in this area, and so I'm very familiar with it. And it's called a Sonsonate. And um, so th these people are from that area, and they resided in that area. And so I was really connected to that whole sense of them coming, be being from that area. And so I really wanted to create this piece as a reflection of a cultural connection, uh, again, that I am disconnected to in some ways. but but truly connected in other ways. Um, and so for me, nature is a foundation that I found um, that really kind of builds on that, that uh, reconnection in that way. And so the tree rings for me are just kind of a representation again of what it means to be connected, whether it's a family, whether it's a, it's a grove of trees, whether it's the stars, the constellations, the universe, whatever in that sense, we're all interwoven in this uh, kind of um, moment and, um, and throughout uh, the moments in history in that way. And, but for me, this piece kind of is just telling a story of that particular place and time that um, I long for in a lot of ways, but um, you know, um, the only way for me to kind of reconnect to at this point in time is through art in some ways. And so thank you, El Comalito, for giving me this moment to just kind of talk a little bit about this piece and just about myself and about my history. And, you know, more than anything, just to be able to hear everyone else and their stories. So thank you again for your time. Thank you so much, um, Luis. And then just very briefly, um, Luis's work is really powerful and really beautiful. We've gotten the honor of working with Luis um, on several occasions, and I just want to quickly point out um, the other pieces that he has in the show. He has this piece here called Café. Um, that's really might, do you oh. mind if I say a little something about this really quick? Of course. No, not at all. Well, the only reason I'd like to say something is that, uh, again, um, I, in talking about my, my, my family and my heritage and who I am in some ways, I have to kind of look and see um, what the where I come from and the shoulders I stand on, and that in that sense, it's uh, my family, my parents, my father, my grandmother, and for me, um, they grew up uh, in El Salvador at a time where plantation fincas were uh, very pre predominant in that way. Seven families owned most of the country in that way. And I believe it's still pretty much in that same sense and kind of even worse in a lot of ways. But anyway, beyond that, they worked at this one particular one plantation and my father was around nine years old. And this portrait uh, that I did is of this little boy. And this is basically um, my father in a lot of ways. And uh, the way I know that is because when my father looked at this painting, he expressed to me how much it brought to him a lot of the memories of growing up and being and doing this type of work. And so for him, he grew up uh, not having a childhood, but experiencing a lot of hardship and really having to struggle to uh, make ends meet. Um, my, my, my grandmother, who is really kind of like my mother in some ways, worked uh, not only in the plantation as well, picking coffee and uh, raising my, my aunt as well, who was younger than my father at the time, and um, she actually cooked in the plant in, in the home in the home in that sense. So there's a, a connection for me in a lot of different ways to this painting, that kind of uh, shows the lineage of who I am, but also uh, the type of kind of um, history that uh, my my parents and my my grandparents and all of our you know people have struggled in a lot of different ways in that way to kind of better each generation in that way or give them opportunities that each generation didn't have in some way. So this, this piece to me is called Café. And to me, uh, coffee is, is uh, not only very connected to me as a little boy, because I started drinking it when I was probably two or three, and I still drink it in a lot of uh, different ways. Um, but it's also connected, uh, as we know, through colonialism and a lot of power and uh, just a lot of things that have occurred within those uh, communities in Central America and just, just in general around the world uh, that are connected to just like with sugar and other commodities in that way that 
it really kind of created the colonial kind of empires that we see today in some way. So this piece not only is a, is a representation of a man who, um, you know, I owe a lot to in a lot of ways, but also is a representation of me and where I came from and just um, what I, you know, really kind of I'm trying to connect to again, not just the indigenous aspects, but also just all the societal connections that um, I may not, I may have been blind to as a young person growing up with blinders that uh, were given to me by uh, colonial sensibilities in that way. And so for me, at the age that I'm at now, I feel very uh, lucky to actually be able to have sight. So again, thank you, El Comalito, for the moment and time. Thank you so much, Luis, and a beautiful way to kind of close the show. I know that we said that we we're gonna have a Q&A, but out of respect for folks' time, the two hours is up. We invite you to reach out to individual artists if you have questions. Um, they are all really accessible. Um, you're welcome to reach out to us. We can connect you or we can answer questions from a curatorial perspective. Um, let's continue to learn, grow, live, and we leave you with this beautiful message that you are strong, you are beautiful, you are powerful, you are you know, body resilient and strong. Never forget that. And if you do, close your eyes, feel the earth. You are brilliant. You are beautiful. You are powerful. Have a beautiful night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having us.